hornpipe by any other name. An uncommon history of several common East Anglian hornpipes. The hornpipe has long been a type of tune associated with traditional dance and a great many, such as Yarmouth Hornpipe and Soldier's Joy, have enjoyed very common currency in East Anglia and indeed almost everywhere else. This popularity is mostly throughout the English-speaking world, but not completely so. In East Anglia, the tune type has been used mainly to accompany step dancing, and this trait is prevalent elsewhere, in particular in areas of the United States and Nova Scotia. The tunes were widely travelled, often under a bewildering plethora of names, some localised, some not. This um, article proposes to investigate the origins and function of several hornpipes commonly played in East Anglia, as far as can be ascertained, and to unravel some of the many names which were given to the tunes. The chosen tunes are certainly not an exhaustive list, rather they are the tunes which seem to be most commonplace in the area, and to a great extent still are. The word hornpipe now generally refers to a group of tunes in common time, 4-4 four, four, or 2-4, which George Emerson describes thus. Tunes with staccato quaver runs, punctuated by the stressing of the second and third beats within the bar at regular intervals, with double stress at the end of phrases. Hornpipes played today fall into this category, although they can either be played straight, as regards the timing, or probably much more frequently dotted. Emerson further makes the distinction that Irish hornpipes are slower and very jaunty, with a rhythmic characteristic comparable to a Strathspey, pure step dance, with the beating of rhythms of the feet. This does not seem so very different from the form and purpose of hornpipes in East Anglia. This type of tune comes into prominence towards the end of the 18th century. Earlier hornpipes were a syncopated limping gait tune in triple time, 3-4, 6-4 or 12-8, which probably originated in the borders. This early style has survived to an extent in pipe tunes and in songs. The examples to be dealt with here are all tunes in common time. Background to these type of hornpipes. The type of hornpipe as we know it came into prominence in the second half of the 18th century and was very popular indeed by the end of the century. A great many music manuscripts have survived, as well as quite a few published works which attest to this. They were very often associated with famous dancers of the day, and in fact several tunes were named for or after such performers. Examples of these will be given later. They were also closely connected with stage performances, as many plays had dances as part of the programme. An example is that a Mrs Vernon danced a new hornpipe in Covent Garden, composed by Thomas Arne in 1760, supposedly the first of this new genre of common type hornpipe. Another example is that famed dancer Arnold Fisher performed a dance called The Scots Measure in a play called The Gentle Measure in 1775. The hornpipe gained a nautical aspect through the stage as well, due to the popularity of such a theme in contemporary plays, probably stimulated by contemporary conflicts and also the publication of Rule Britannia in 1740. The sailor's hornpipe almost certainly made its first appearance in the bawdy comic play The Whopping Landlady in 1767, again danced by Fisher. Step dancing. In East Anglia, as often elsewhere, the hornpipe is synonymous with step dancing, and so before considering the tunes, it's worthwhile looking at this very popular form of largely solo dance, which generally took place in public houses. It was largely, but not entirely, the preserve of men, beating out of rhythm with their feet to a hornpipe, with varying complexity of steps. Early in the 20th century, of those who did partake, Women would draw up their skirts short, pull the back of the skirt forward between their legs to show their feet and ankles. In East Anglia recently, there were certainly several well-known female dancers, but the majority were men. Fiona Davis is here to demonstrate some step dancing for us. <laughs> That 
this practice was not at all confined to East Anglia is shown by the following from a commentator from Worksop. There were many men step dancers and a few women ones well into the latter half of the 19th century in most villages and step dancing displays were usual incidents at feasts and wakes. On Saturday nights also, stepping would suddenly break out at village alehouses when two or three men would pit themselves against each other in short spells, hardly of the nature of contests. When a lad, I saw many such steppings and step dancers are no means dead, although gone out of village life maybe. A good dancer was one capable of taking any step music, with or without music whatever. Many of the dancers used stepping shoes or light clogs, the latter preferred in clog wearing localities. Nimbleness and clatter were essentials, with a good crowdy, meaning fiddler, to give the music. There were a number of men who were good crowdies, playing from ear the tunes to which the dancers stepped. The dancing was always on wood, a floor or large table, the latter preferred as the steppings and beats could be heard to better advantage. Some danced without the crowdy, but it was to music which they knew by heart and carried in their feet. When the dancing was done without a crowdy, the listeners could tell the tunes by the steps and the beats on the boards. Sometimes there would be a couple of dancers on the table. When one had gone through a arranged number of steps, he stopped, the other taking his place. And this was done so deftly that there was no break in the music whilst the change was made. The old fiddlers were hard to tire, and one crowded with intervals to wet his whistle could keep it up for hours. This full account could easily apply to East Anglia, aside from the clogs and the word crowdy, which has never been used in this locality. This was the typical use to which these common time tunes were put, the typical native English hornpipe. Although it is much less frequently used to accompany country dances, involving many participants, where a step hop motion was required, such as in the Nottingham Swing. It spread far and wide, in particular to the eastern provinces of North America. Another quote. One time I was at my uncle's and there was a violin player there. He asked if anyone could dance. They pointed to me and said, there's Reuben. So he said, how many steps can you dance? I said, about 14 or 15. He said, I couldn't, so I said, I'll give you a different step every time, and at the end of each, a double back step. I danced 15 different steps, and he laid a $5 gold piece down. I'd learned to dance when I was in America. If I saw a dancer, I caught on. These are some of the steps. Double back shuffle, cross steps, shingle, strip the willow, dodging six, hunt the squirrel, American eight, sliding step, Lift your leg, rustic dance, and triple shuffle. Yarmouth hornpipe. One of the very common hornpipes in East Anglia and way beyond is the Yarmouth hornpipe. The tune spread far and wide and had a great many names, including the above, which is what it was referred to in Norfolk and also occasionally elsewhere. In Suffolk, it's generally known as Pigeon on the Gate, and in the north of England as the Manchester hornpipe. As the latter name it was used in a published version, many people have assumed that it was the proper name for the tune. The reality is much more complicated. The tune is undoubtedly one of those hornpipes which surfaced sometime in the second half of the 18th century, but the exact provenance of which is not known, as is generally the case. The first published version appeared in Alexander McGlashan's Collection of Scots Measures in 1781 in Edinburgh. The tune wasn't given a name but was noted as as danced by Aldridge. Robert Aldridge was a famous dancer of the time from Dublin who made his name performing in Covent Garden and Drury Lane, London as well as in his native Dublin and in Edinburgh. He was also a ballet master in London. The tune is sometimes known as Aldridge's hornpipe as a consequence. The tune crossed the Atlantic, as did so many, and became identified with John Bill Ricketts, an equestrian, circus entrepreneur and dancer 
who lived between 1769 and 1802. He was English born, moved to America as a young man, establishing his first large multi-act circus in the country. He became something of a celebrity before his early death at the age of 33, when he was lost at sea en route back to England. The tune became highly popular amongst American musicians as Ricketts Hornpipe and was published in several manuscript books in the United States before 1800. It gained other names, such as the One-Eyed Fiddler, and is still a staple today, a good example of a tune with enduring popularity on both sides of the Atlantic. As an aside, one of Ricketts' associates was the famed dancer John Durang. He was a dancer and acrobat in Ricketts' circus, as well as becoming a business partner at one point. He was hailed as the first American dancer, born in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, of German parents in 1768. From a theatrical family, he danced hornpipes on stage on a regular basis. He was self-taught, learning by observing other dancers. On 7th of November, 1790, he danced, apparently, a hornpipe on 13 eggs blindfolded without breaking one. This feat became known as the egg dance, about which more later. He danced in the ballets of William Francis that went into a teaching partnership with him between 1794 and about 1806. These dancers really were highly regarded celebrities and in 1785 Durang's German violin master, Mr Hofmaster, composed Durang's hornpipe for him in New York. This tune became very popular in America and remains so to this day. The tune certainly had widespread currency in East Anglia as either Yarmouth Hornpipe or Pigeon on the Gate to accompany step dancing in the usual 4-4 common time. There is one example of a loose version in 6-8 time for the long dance which was noted down by Joan Rowe at Wayford Bridge. <laughs> enjoyed widespread popularity, typical of those connected with stage performances of a nautical flavour, as the name suggests. As mentioned, Fischar brought the tune to wide appreciation when he danced to it in The Whopping Landlady in 1790. This play was an amorous romp involving the eponymous lady and a group of jack tars, and was a great success. It's at the epitome of the tunes which were part of such a performance. Dancers were billed as hornpipes, even if they weren't, sometimes just as a sailor's dance. Hornpipes were also billed sometimes even when there was no allusion to sailors, or anything nautical, but the association stuck, with the sailor's hornpipe becoming synonymous with hornpipe in general. To further complicate matters, the sailor's hornpipe was the dance, and the actual tune was the college hornpipe. Both titles are still used for the same tune, even though there is a completely separate tune, also known as the College Hornpipe. <laughs>
marginal entry perhaps, as this tune was not of wide currency in the area, but certainly carried a local name. Melodian player Percy Brown from the Aylsham area was the only musician to have been recorded playing it, often as part of a medley with Harvest Home or Yarmouth Hornpipe. It is sometimes known as Percy Brown's step dance as a consequence. Used to accompany such dancing in North Norfolk, particularly the Davies family and others in Cromer. Reg Hall commented of it, the tune is a lovely example of the undotted English hornpipe, very much in vogue in East Anglia throughout most of the 20th century and probably dating from the 19th. Further afield, it's related to Lemmy Brazel's tap dance. <laughs> tune indeed, with several examples of recordings of East Anglian musicians playing it. Yet another tune with various names, for example Billy Cooper called it Yarmouth Hornpipe, even though he played the usual tune of that name as well. It has a great many names, some of which are the Blacksmith's Hornpipe, the Clover Blossom and Slaley Bridge Hornpipe. The tune was published in Kerr's Merry Melodies Volume 1, in about 1880, and again in 1898 by William Honeyman in his Strathspey Reel and Hornpipe Tutor in the key of A. Phil Heath Coleman has described it as probably the most popular hornpipe amongst traditional musicians in England until the end of the 20th century. A cylinder recording was made of Hereford Gypsy John Locke playing it in about 1905 by Ella Leather. A widespread tune overall, it was also known as Smith's Hornpipe in Wales. <laughs>
very popular tune in East Anglia, particularly in its showing and breakdown form to accompany step dancing. The forehand reel is basically a simplified version of the first two parts of the Londonderry hornpipe. Yet another tune which probably goes back into the 18th century, it, this is one which has several names. The Hingham dulcimer player Billy Cooper called it English Breakdown, and Cromer Melodeon player Bob Davies, The Gates of Edinburgh. The sharing and breakdown version is highly simplified, almost exclusively played by Melodeon players to accompany step dancing. The usual practice being just to play the A music of the tune being repeated as necessary, really just laying down a rhythm in much the same way as Albert Hewitt's Southrep's Hornpipe. In various versions, the tune has enduring popularity across the country. Blakeney Hornpipe. Another marginal entry, but yet again having a local name, this tune was not widespread amongst the East Anglian traditional musicians, at least as far as recordings give as evidence. The only version known is by Herbert Smith, fiddler of Blakeney in Norfolk. It's also known as the Lass on the Strand and the Belfast Hornpipe, the latter published in O'Neill's Music of Ireland in 1907. A version known simply as The Breakdown was recorded from Harry Lee, a gypsy settled in Kent, by Ken Stubbs and Paul Carter in 1962. This had a very different B music though. <laughs> tune is named for the aforementioned dancer Arnold Fishar and was known therefore as Fishar's Hornpipe but later more commonly as Fisher's Hornpipe and sometimes as Fisherman's Hornpipe. It's another tune with very common currency in the United States seeming to have travelled widely. The tune was also known as the Egg Hornpipe as Fishar replicated Durang's trick of dancing blindfolded on eggs. The Egg Dance. And this tune was used under this title as it was noted by John Clare, the Northamptonshire poet, as one of the tunes he collected in the 1820s. Walter Bulwer of Shipton was also recorded playing the tune as part of a medley of hornpipes under this title in 1959. The tune had many other names, too many to mention, including O'Dwyer's hornpipe and the bizarre Wig on the Green. It's another tune published in McGlashan's A Collection of Scots Measures in 1781, again untitled and again with the note that it was danced by Aldridge. <laughs>
This is another tune with an old pedigree and wide currency indeed. It's been described as one of the most frequently played tunes in the English-speaking world. In fact, its popularity spread further than that. It was also common in Scandinavia. For example, the Danish Hornfiffen is a variant. It's thought that the tune dates back to the early 18th century, but its exact provenance is uncertain. It was first published in 1756 in the third volume of Rutherford's complete collection of 200 of the most celebrated country dances, both old and new. The tune has carried many different sets of words. For example, Robert Burns used it for the first song of the cantata, The Jolly Beggars, writing dark lyrics about a dismembered homeless veteran, sarcastically recounting his delight with battle. Also, Thomas Hardy mentions it in Far From The Many Crowd, commenting that it had much merit as a tune for dancing to. In this instance, he seems to refer to communal country dancing rather than step dancing. The tune had several other names, including The King's Head and Payday in the Army. This latter has given rise, unsurprisingly, to the suggestion that the meaning is just that. Others have suggested that it's a reference to the rum ration given to troops in the British Army, or to a concoction containing morphine, of which more in a second. Soldier's Joy has always been very popular in the United States. In fact, it's been described there as an American classic, even though there's nothing to suggest that it's of American origin. It's been recorded from a great many musicians, described by the Library of Congress as one of the oldest and most widely distributed tunes. The American suggestion for the name's meaning dates back to the American Civil War and has given a rather dark reference to a concoction of whiskey, beer and morphine given to soldiers during surgical operations, particularly amputations. In this context, there are several verses put to the tune, such as Give me some of that soldier's joy, you know what I mean. I don't want to hurt no more, my leg is turning green. <laughs> the tune was certainly popular amongst East Anglian musicians, once again mainly used to accompany step dancing. Along with the Armouth Hornpipe, it was probably the tune most played at communal gatherings where such music was performed. <laughs> are a selection of tunes which were played in East Anglia regularly, most commonly for step dancing. As can be seen, their provenance is old and many travelled widely and extensively. There's a particular connection between Britain and Ireland on the one hand, the old world, and the United States and Canada on the other, the new world. The tunes travelled across the Atlantic with emigrants and became staples of rural musicians for social occasions in both areas. A good indication of the influence of the old world on the new is the prevalence of British styles and repertoire in Nova Scotia, in particular that of Scotland, where the influence is very marked indeed. 
Likewise, many older fiddlers from the United States sounded very much like their counterparts in Britain and Ireland in many respects, particularly in the central and western states, although it was also the case in the east in Appalachia. Hornpipes were a large part of this cross-fertilisation and influence, as we have seen. A great many recordings have been made of players from East Anglia performing these tunes and other similar ones. Similarly, the tunes were noted down in a wide variety of places. This includes local examples, such as the manuscript book of 1890 of fiddler George Watson, who was living in Swanton Abbot at the time. Almost certainly none of the tunes are East Anglian in origin, but they've established themselves thoroughly and deeply in the repertoires of local country musicians over a period of decades. And in that context, have become local tunes completely and an interesting part of our traditional musical heritage. Mm -hmm.